Buenos días a todos. Siendo las 7 en punto, vamos a, a dar inicio a la actividad. De nuevo le agradecemos en nombre del Departamento de Cardiología de la Universidad de Antioquia, el doctor Mena, por acompañarnos. Bienvenido, doctor. Esta es su casa. Eh, hoy tenemos con nosotros al doctor Carlos Mena. Él es eh, médico de la Universidad de Antioquia, cardiólogo intervencionista, es fellow de la ACC, de la SCAI y de la Sociedad de Medicina Vascular. Es profesor asociado de Medicina y Cardiología y director de Medicina Vascular y codirector del programa VAMOS, que traduce eh, Vascular Medicine Outcomes Program en, en Yale New Haven Hospital y en Yale University. Y hoy nos acompaña con su conferencia Integrative Care in the Management of Patients with Cardiovascular Disease, a Paradigm Shift. Doctor Mena, bienvenido y muchas gracias de nuevo por acompañarnos. Buenos días, muchísimas gracias y primero que todo me da un enorme placer y orgullo de tener la oportunidad de hablar con ustedes. Como el doctor acaba de mencionar, yo soy paisa, estudié en la Universidad de Antioquia y tengo un cariño y apreciación impresionante porque les debo toda mi a, carrera profesional. En la lista de participantes veo muchos amigos y profesores, veo al doctor Senior, al doctor Jaramillo, que son, en la época cuando yo era estudiante de pregrado en la Universidad de Antioquia, eran mis mentores y la gente que yo pensaba pues que eran mis ídolos en el momento y me dieron un ejemplo muy grande y, y me ayudaron de muchas maneras y mucha otra gente en la Universidad de Antioquia a poder uh, salir cuando era interno a través de las becas Tangarife, que creo que se llamaban en esa época, no sé si haya cambiado de nombre. Pero gracias a todo eso, uh, tuve la oportunidad invaluable de venir y, y hacer uh, medicina interna y luego cardiología y hemodinamia y permanecer aquí. Entonces les agradezco mucho, un cariño muy grande, ojalá pudiera estar en persona y verlos a todos, a, a, ojalá que algún momento pueda tener esa oportunidad y, y hacer casos y, y recordar buenas memorias. Um, en todo caso, lo que les voy a hablar es un poquito diferente a los temas comunes que un hemodinamista uh, tendría que hablar, especialmente porque el mundo de hemodinamia se centra mucho alrededor de nuestras intervenciones eh, y los resultados a corto, mediano y largo plazo. Ciertamente, aquí en Estados Unidos, la incidencia de enfermedad coronaria, como ustedes saben, es muy grande uh, y el desarrollo en ese aspecto del manejo del paciente ha, ha sido considerablemente avanzado. Pero uh, a medida que empecé a, a mirar lo que hacíamos y cómo lo hacíamos, me llamó mucho la atención que como hemodinamista coronario de enfermedad periférica, el centro de nuestra atención y de nuestra formación aquí particularmente es centrada acerca de las intervenciones, abrir una arteria, cualquiera que sea la localización. Pero por muchas razones, incluyendo uh, en, encuentros con pacientes y el trabajo que he hecho, con una doctora uh, que se llama Kim Smoldren, uh, me di uh, a entender que per, de pronto para ayudar a los pacientes de una manera más significativa y más poderosa, aparte de revascularizarlos, probablemente al, en el momento en que pensé al respecto, sea tan importante o, o de pronto más importante tratar de entender el paciente en una dimensión mucho más grande, especialmente en lo que se relata a, a la relación entre uh, la salud mental y la enfermedad cardiovascular, no solamente coronaria, pero periférica. Entonces, aquí hemos uh, empezado a hacer un trabajo muy grande con la American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and SKY, uh, en relación al manejo integral del paciente con enfermedad coronaria en el cual es, hay avanza, uh, uh, bastante uh, desarrollo, pero en la enfermedad periférica es un poco limitado. Entonces, mi grupo de investigación empezamos a trabajar al respecto y ese va a ser el centro de la presentación que les voy a describir. Um, 
voy a cambiar a inglés porque todas las diapositivas son en inglés y es mucho más fácil hacerlo de esa manera. Uh, mis um, disclosures, uh, tengo uh, investigación patrocinada o soportada por Shockwave, Merck, Phillips, Abbott. Y yo soy un consultante para algunas de esas compañías como está en la diapositiva. Okay, so what am I going to talk to you about today? So the first thing is I'm going to talk to you about health psychology response to the post-war chronic disease burden. And the reason why it's important is because I want to put it in context. The second thing that I'm going to try to go through is the emergence of cardiac uh, psychology. I think that as I am talking about complementary therapies, it's important to recognize where do they come from and what is their deal, especially from when you're looking at it from the cardiac perspective. We strongly believe that there is a connection between heart, mind, and vascular disease. And exploring this likely will result in changing clinical outcomes for our patients. And last but not least, I'm going to walk you uh, through what we think a cardiac and vascular psychology and integrated care should look like across large health systems. Yale New Haven Health is one of the largest, if not the largest health systems in the United States. So we have the opportunity to impact lots of lots of patients. So the first thing that I want to talk to you is what is the American Psychological Association definition of health psychology? And it's important because when I started looking at this, it was a foreign concept and trying to understand who they are, what they do and how they accomplish is of paramount importance so we can put this into context. So health psychology examines how biological, social and psychological factors influence health and illness. Health psychologists use psychological science to promote health, prevent illness, and improve healthcare systems. So when I first started talking about this concept uh, in our interventional group, everybody thought that I was losing my mind in terms of why are you shifting from talking about how to open an SFA or open an LED to talking about psychologists? But as you will see throughout the lecture, there is a very strong connection and important points to be made. So the emergence of health psychology uh, is an important thing. And there are eight points that you see in this slide that I think contribute in a significant fashion to uh, where we are today. Increasing epidemiologic, epidemiological evidence uh, of behavior and disease incidence. For instance, the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. Rising costs of healthcare and need for effectiveness and efficiency. For us, value care is an important thing. And what interventions do we need to do to lessen rehospitalization, readmissions, and clinical outcomes short and long-term is important. Teaching behavioral science in medical schools like ours, like yours, communications skill training to improve uh, patients' adherence to medications, patient satisfaction. So this touches upon, you can be the best interventionalist, but if the patient doesn't take the medications, that stand is gonna go down and is as bad as if you didn't do it to begin with. The other concept that has become incredibly important, particularly here, and FDA uh, has put a lot of effort in our work, is patient satisfaction and alludes to patient-reported outcomes. The integration of clinical psychology and behavioral medicine into primary care setting. So back home in Colombia, uh, internal medicine doctors and the connection between what you guys do and mental health providers is incredibly important. Uh, the amount of anxiety, stress, depression, and other mental health problems can negatively influence all uh, your intervention and care. Development and testing of evidence-based behavioral change models. This is when it becomes interesting because they have done a lot of work trying to determine this, and I will give you concrete examples as I go through the talk. One of the things that Dr. Smolder and I focus here at Yale is the prediction models of health behavioral change, emphasis on beliefs, attitudes, and behavior, which has been established for a long time. As you see in the slide, early studies in the 70s showed that. This resulted in the emergence of the field of psychoneuroimmunology, for instance. And in the 80s, uh, AIDS and HIV epidemic really here in the U.S. increased dramatically the funding from NIH and other institutions to increase funding for behavioral research. 
For instance, we have an NIH grant now looking at the uh, association with pain, PAD, and clinical outcomes. Millions upon millions of dollars are being spent. This is the president of our university, and uh, he's a psychologist. And uh, in 1989 or so, uh, he made this statement, uh, and it resonates in uh, the walls of our institution. People's sense of their own health is not only the reflection of their psychological and physical well-being, but also a predictor of subsequent physical health. So here, he was telling us that the intersection between mental health and physical health are critical. And only if you are able to understand and decipher both, it can result in improved people's clinical outcomes and clinical situation, whatever that may be. Here, uh, the psychology group section department has been at the forefront of these issues. This is a landmark uh, paper uh, that is often quoted, again, from the 70s. It goes back a long time. And it's the foundational Yale Conference on Behavioral Medicine. At that time, they proposed definitions and statement of goals that are relevant today in the way we apply these principles in all chronic diseases, such as coronary artery disease and peripheral vascular disease. So how did it all begin? So I'm gonna specifically center for the next few minutes, both in coronary artery disease, you guys are very familiar with it, as well as peripheral vascular disease. And I'm gonna show you some of the evidence uh, about the connection between the two of them, some of which has been done by our group. Start a long time ago, and it's interesting because things that we felt or thought that were not that relevant actually were really relevant even today. Type A personality, the types of personalities and the association with clinical outcomes was something that was taken into consideration in many uh, chronic illness and coronary artery disease, as you will see, anger, hostility, type A personality plays a predominant role uh, in what patients will do after having an acute coronary syndrome, such as STEMI. Depression, somatic depression, and cognitive symptoms also play a major role, anxiety, stress, and uh, other mental health disorders negatively would affect uh, the patient's ability to interact uh, with uh, his surroundings, including social inhibition, which ultimately will negatively affect their ability to be adherent to his medications, physical uh, therapy, exercise, and all the things that we tell them to do after an acute coronary syndrome so they uh, recover. If they don't do those things, invariably they will do poorly. Let me show you, for instance, this was a study, and I'm showing you really, really old studies, but I'm doing this to show you that uh, we didn't make this up and we didn't come up with it in the last few years. This is a study, <clears throat> which is a very good study, in JAMA from 1959. And they looked the association of a specific overt behavioral patterns with blood and cardiovascular findings. Basically, they tried to look predictors of outcome in coronary artery disease. And this was the one of the early studies that showed the connection between people's personalities and CAD. They look type A, 83 men who display an intense sustained drive for achievement and as being continually involved in competition deadlines, both at work and in their avocations, pretty much like everybody in the audience. Type B, 83 uh, men who manifested the opposite sort of behavioral pattern. Type C, 46 unemployed blind men selected as manifested a chronic state of insecurity and anxiety. Clinical coronary artery disease was seven times more frequent in group A than in group B or group C. That study that was pulled in JAMA was followed up by one of what I think, there are many landmark trials in coronary artery disease, but these two uh, people in the slide certainly 
in the early 90s, published a paper that I still think now to today is a major reference as it relates to this field. 1993, I was in my second semester of med school uh, in our beloved alma mater. What did they do? They published in JAMA, depression following myocardial infarction, impact on six month survival. It was an observational uh, follow-up study, single center, car in the ICU in uh, Canada, 222 patients, 78% were male, interviewed between day five and 15 following an acute myocardial infarction. What they did was a National Institute of Mental Health Diagnostic interview for major depressive disorder. The analysis, as you are all well familiar, was a Cox uh, proportional hazard analysis. The primary outcome was survival studies at six months, obtained from medical records and then adjudicated. If you look at the graph on the right, it's astonishing how those that were depressed versus those that were not depressed, and you see the N there, had a significant difference in clinical outcome, heart endpoints, mortality. Uh, and this was incredible, had never been shown or done. We were fixated in thrombolytics at the time. We were given aspirin, statins were not around. Um, beta blockers were certainly not the ones that are currently, but other generations. And then this come along and is the connection between mental health and clinical outcomes and the powerful influence in outcomes. If you look further in the study, the results show you 16% met criteria for major depressive disorder at the time of the interview. 12 patients died at six months of follow-up. 50% uh, were less than 50% were depressed and inclusion, meaning these patients develop a major depressive disorder as they were having their acute coronary syndrome or such. Mortality in the press were 70% versus 3% in those that were non depressed. And all cause mortality was fatal myocardial infarction, arrhythmia, and severe congestive heart failure. The adjusted heart, uh, heart uh, ratios for depression was 4.29 uh, with a confidence interval, as you see it in the slide, which uh, with a significant p value. Why is this a landmark trial? It reopened the discussions of paramount importance between psychosocial behavioral factors in the management of patients with cardiac disease. It offered a manageable explanation of the mind-body connection in the care of patients with heart disease. No gender bias, and introduced an important concept that served as an explanation for racial and gender disparities in cardiac clinical outcomes. So we're talking about the 90s. And at this point, we're introducing the concept of social determinants of health, that uh, this could be a element in the explanation of the whole story. It is relevant because it was later replicated, large cohort, uh, cohorts with more than 2,000 patients, longer follow-up studies, wide range of coronary artery disease patient groups, not only at risk of adverse prognosis, but also quality of life was affected. And I had talked about the importance of patient-related outcomes and poor adherence, lack of physical exercise, which as you know, translated into today, are the pillars of medical therapy in patients with coronary artery disease. It is for sure that depression and mental health disorders after a cardiac event uh, has a significant adverse uh, profile in this population. Depression is common and persistent in acute myocardial infarction uh, in patients that survive an acute MI. One in five will have major depressive disorder. One in three will have clinically relevant disorders. And only a third of patients recognize that they are depressed during an acute myocardial uh, infarction admission. The InterHeart study, which was published in The Lancet, uh, which I'm sure you are familiar with. It's a case control design of uh, over 11,000 patients with the first myocardial infarction and 13,000 patients age match up to five years. They were sex or gender match controls uh, from 262 centers in Asia, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Australia, 
North and, of course, South America. Psychosocial stress was assessed by four simple questions about the stress at work, home, financial stress, and major life events in the past year. Additional questions uh, assess locus of control or uh, and presence of depression. And you can see and highlight here, uh, as seen in the slide, the impact and the risk of myocardial infarction as you look at it in terms of mental health disease. 40% of women, 40% of incidence of acute myocardial infarction in women due to exposure to uh, psychosocial uh, factors. That's pretty remarkable when you see uh, the uh, issue as it relates to gender. Okay, so I give you some clinical outcomes and then the question that everybody asks is, all right, you have shown that there is potentially a link between all this, but let's take it a, a notch up and tell us what is the mechanism or how does this uh, happen? You know, you remember uh, reading Robbins, the pathology book, or Goodman and Gilman, the pharmacology book, and try to understand the mechanisms as to how things happen and how do we treat them. Okay, so this is a slide, uh, Pulleys and Jack, that tries to uh, connect all those. Chronic stress, affective disorders, uh, and clearly uh, there is an activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that invariably affects the sympathetic nervous systems. And this definitely results in uh, abnormal behaviors, altered behaviors, if you will. This heightened the physiologic response to acute stress, which may interact with chronic stressors to cause more adverse effects in a vicious cycle. So how does that work? If you have an increase in the system, there is a adrenergic state which ultimately results, uh, as you know, in insulin resistance, central obesity, hypertension, inflammation, platelet activation, endothelial dysfunction, ovarian dysfunction, decreased bone density, somatic effects. There is basic science behind each one of these mechanisms. It's not the purpose of my talk to elaborate on that, but suffice to say that there is a clear connection between these um, outside stressors and the influence of mental health and the connection with our body and how do they relate to different uh, ill states, if you will. All right, so there are adverse outcomes. There seems to be a uh, biological mechanism. Have there been any trials or studies looking at the relationship between them as it relates to therapy. In other words, if you treat those conditions, would they have an impact in uh, the management and or uh, the life expectancy or outcomes in patients with cardiovascular disease? In the slide, there are plenty of examples of multiple studies published in high profile journals, including JAMA, JAK, uh, Ar Archives of Internal Medicine, where this has been explored and addressing mental health issues affects in a positive way clinical outcomes in this patient. I chose this one because I think it's an important one. Uh, and if you're looking uh, for references, I think that this is relevant. It's a little bit older, policy and circulation, cardiovascular quality and outcomes. And it's basically stress reduction prolongs lives in patients with coronary artery disease. And is the switch uh, study, which means the Stockholm All Women's Interventional Trial for Coronary Artery Disease. And just I draw you to the conclusion: although mechanisms remain unclear, a group-based psychosocial intervention program for women with coronary artery disease may prolong lives independent of other prognostic factors, i.e., the medications that we do. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that addressing mental health should take place uh, of opening the LED, giving beta blockers, giving dual antibiotic therapy. That's not my point. My point is that in an era with medical therapy has uh, advanced dramatically and many uh, of the outcomes have plateaued, it is important 
for us to start looking at what other things are going to move the needle to improve the outcomes in this population. And it is the combination of revascularization techniques and therapies, advanced medical therapy, diet and exercise, and mental health, and addressing those, what will improve further the outcome of these patients. So because of that, there has been a continued interest, uh, not only here at Yale, but throughout the US and Europe, and probably uh, in other places in the world, about the issue of uh, cardiac psychology as a subspecialty is irrelevant. And there are presentations, papers, books, uh, written uh, for lay people, also for medical people. But up until the American Psychological Association adopted this, it became uh, more intense, the association between the two of them, to the point that many of the patients, many of the trainees actually, that uh, are in these programs, particularly here at Yale, rotate through our cardiovascular uh, service line uh, to get exposed and to understand and the relationship between the two between the two of them and how do we treat it and how that how would that look like? We have an outpatient clinic where the patient with an acute MI or critical ischemia comes is seen, and after uh, we see the patient, there is a significant amount of screening about mental health issues. And if the patients do test positive or the provider has concerns about that. The patient is referred uh, to uh, the mental health provider, which could be a psychologist or psychiatrist who, who is located at the same clinic. So our clinics don't only have an interventional cardiologist, a general cardiologist, non-invasive testing, including echoes, stress tests and such, but there is nutritionist, there is a social worker, there is a psychologist slash psychiatrist, there is an endocrinologist, and they are not seeing the patient all at the same time, meaning every patient does not get all those services, but depending upon the need, the stage of their disease process and where they are, they get seen by one or the other so that we as a whole can improve the patient overall clinical outcome. So we do understand that there is a strong connection between coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, and cerebrovascular disease. And as you know, atherosclerosis is a systemic disorder that affects all the different vascular beds. Uh, at any given time, we concentrate on one or the other. But let me talk to you a little bit about peripheral vascular disease. Uh, I know in Colombia, particularly, uh, interventionally is uh, predominantly focused in coronary artery disease, but there is a group of uh, physicians uh, that I know that do like the PAD work, but there is a large presence of vascular medicine. I remember all my uh, mentors from the, the time when I was in the uh, Universidad that uh, we would go uh, to the then Blue Pavilion and we would go to the vascular lab uh, with Dr. Mejia and others and, and, and we would just get into this. It was interesting. So vascular disease, as you will know, is a marker, marker of generalized atherosclerotic disease, which is manifested by reduced blood flow in the lower extremities, upper extremities in this case, and I'm going to concentrate in the lower extremities. Globally, there is a large burden here in the U.S., about eight and a half million people deal with this thing, it is increasing in high income, low and middle income countries, both for uh, women and men driven by a rapid growing uh, uh, in the aging population and a steady increase in obesity, diabetes, and other comorbidities. And as you see in the slide, those continue to increase is a major uh, safety health concern for us, as well as for you and all over. I'll quickly walk you through this. In the right side, you see PAD population. Many of them are asymptomatic. It doesn't mean that they don't need medical therapy. Many of them are symptomatic, and there is a wide spectrum between those that have atypical symptoms to those that have critical ischemia, which is an area of emphasis of our program, and those that have claudication. Patients with PAD, 
at the spite of uh, optimal medical therapy, residual risk for major adverse cardiovascular events and major adverse lens events is quite, is quite high, up to 10% per year. Critical limb ischemia, the worst of all the spectrum that I just described, has a 20% mortality rate at six months and up to 50% at five years. And the main cause of mortality is cardiovascular, cerebrovascular disease. If you look at our Medicare claims from, um, I give you this, uh, this old data, we actually have newer data, but if you use a reference to that using ICD-9 and CPT codes, it costs um, $4 billion plus. Uh, These numbers are significantly higher nowadays. And it represents a major amount of expenditure in patients uh, when they come into the hospital. So it's not a very small problem. It's a huge problem for us. And as you know, we have the traditional risk factors, including getting older, overweight, smoking, which is a major one, diabetes, lifestyle, and so forth, so on. But is there evidence between depression and PAD as a risk factor for such? And believe it or not, uh, many of the work uh, led by my partner here at Yale, Dr. Smoldering, has shown that it is prevalent and that is associated with adverse events in patients with peripheral vascular disease. And the prevalence, as you see, ranges anywhere between 15 to 30 percent or so. This is a paper that we published in Jack, uh, and we were looking at uh, the rate of CLI admissions from the national inpatient sample. And you can see here <clears throat> that the number of patients with PAD is on the rise. And we stratified them uh, based upon the age, meaning younger versus older. And one thing that was incredibly striking, and we use the definition of 65, is that in patients that are younger, it's incredibly high, the rate of increase. So PAD, this told us that it's not only a disease of the elderly, but it's also increasingly high in younger patients with the same uh, uh, profile or different profile, as you will see, than uh, patients with older disease. We then look at uh, the ho hospitalization rate in patients that had PAD with associated anxiety and depression. It was a large sample. Again, we published this in, the, in Jack and over 2 million people. And this is what it looks like in patients that are presenting uh, with PAD, CLI, and comorbid anxiety and depression increasingly going up. So it's not only younger people, but also <clears throat> is associated with this, how patients with PAD are presented in our facilities. Their profiles, and we talk about social determinants of health, focus on the younger patients. Many of them are Black. Many of them are Hispanics. We have a huge problem with our population, Latinos como nosotros. We have a significant issue in the management of uh, coronary artery disease and peripheral vascular disease. We have published on this showing the lack and the disparities of care in this population, okay? Many of them with significant okay. issues in terms of coverage and insurance is a reality. This is whether you look at women or whether you look at men. So it is a real problem. Uh, in terms of the comorbidities, you will find pretty much the same comorbidities that you have in patients, uh, uh, in older patients, which is diabetes, hypertension, smoking, and such. But when you start looking at mental health, Look at the prevalence of mental health in the younger population. If you look at depression, if you look at, and compare it with all those that are older, right? If you look at depression, you look at bipolar disorder, you look at anxiety disorder, you look at stress-related disorder, you look at alcohol abuse, and look at the drug abuse. So these patients with critical limb ischemia, we're talking about critical limb ischemia. And my question to the group and my colleagues is, if I have someone with CLI that comes into the cath lab today, I open the SFA, the below the knee circulation, I do everything. I put them in all medical therapy. Why aren't they getting better? And look for other reasons why these people are not getting better, whether it's 
mental health, whether it's whatever, give me reasons. And we started diving into it. And it becomes clear and evident that the burden of mental health in these people, most of which was untreated, which makes it even worse, uh, is high and portends adverse outcomes, which what are the outcomes? And you can take a look and major amputation in those patients with depression versus no depression, whether they undergo endovascular therapy or surgical therapy. We publish this in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, and we prove that mental health impacts outcomes in both cohorts. Okay. How about other outcomes that are important to our health systems? And this becomes relevant because in the US system, in order to get programs going, you got to show a financial gain or at least not a loss. And here we show that if those patients who have depression versus not, the length of a stay, both for endo and surgical, and the cost associated with their admission is significantly different. Should you address that, probably you'll have a cost saving. So I tra we translated or interventions or work or studies into dollars that the hospital can see. Once we do that, then we have a program. And here again, we're looking at outcomes in terms of all-cause mortality and major adverse links events in those patients that had uh, major depression versus not, and is relevant. It's incredibly relevant. This is a study, a multicenter study uh, that uh, we've done here in the US and Australia and the Netherlands, and is known as the portrait uh, study. And it's a patient, uh, it's a study funded by PCORI, which is Patient Center Outcomes Research Institute. And it was basically <clears throat> looking at patients with claudication and looking for uh, patient-related outcomes. So we enrolled 1,200 patients in a prospective health status data, focus on health status outcomes and quality of care processes. Many centers, as you can see in this slide, were involved. And we look, and those were claudicans, those were not CLI. And we look for the uh, effect of mental health burden, depression, anxiety, and stress in patients with claudication, okay? And this is what they look like. A baseline with new diagnosis of PAD, many of them were burdened by this with a cumulative presence, uh, prevalence of about 35% and a one-year follow-up with workup management revascularization options. Mind you, mental health was not being addressed. 21% of those patients remain having issues. So yeah, we put a stand in the SFA. We did a FEMPOP bypass. We give them medical therapy. We opened the LAD. We gave them medications, but they are still not being managed adequately from this other dimension. And if we don't do that, the clinical outcomes are different. And here is a very elegant study published in JAMA where we show that those that have chronic stress with versus not fare different. So when we show this and we show that it also affects patients with uh, not only CAD, but now we're showing that affects patients with PAD, we make a strong case for our heart and vascular center to have mental health providers as part of our team, an active team that manages and treats patients. So when I see someone yeah, I'm more um, you know sensitive to these topics and I try to address them and look at them. I am an interventional cardiologist. My focus and when I go to clinic with my fellows and my students continues to be coronary artery disease, looking at angiograms, doing revascularization and what have you. But now I have one other point to make before I leave the room. And that point, many patients come back and tell me, thank you for saving my life. And when I further ask them what made the difference, it's funny because placing the stand, although as critical as it is, often is not recognized as the major intervention. But what they care about was the fact that I spent five more minutes of my time talking about these important issues. I must say that our bedside manner 
meaning the one that I learned in La Universidad de Antioquia in La Facultad de Medicina, has been one of my major assets to become successful in this environment, being warm, being nice, open, and willing to listen and address what people want or need is an important component of our training. I tell you, if I had to do my training all over again, without a doubt, I would do uh, med school back in Colombia, back in the Universidad de Antioquia. I got lucky because I got a pathway to come here and do all these different things. But my foundation was in every single rotation that I did in La Universidad, in every single one of the community hospitals in mi año rural. And I think it's important. And I'm saying this not to blow smoke, you know where, but to tell you that you got to love, cherish what you're getting there. Uh, and people like me miss it, love it. And people like me treasure it, endorse it. And it's one of our more important things. Uh, I often get medical students that come from uh, from Medellin and other places in the world, and they walk into my office. And the first diploma that they see, and without you know bragging about it, I got a lot of diplomas, but the biggest diploma, the most important diploma that I have is that, and I wish I could show it to you, but is that of the Universidad de Antioquia. It's my most pressured treasure. And I say this, guys, because I'm talking to you right now, uh, and it makes me incredibly happy. So going back to this, chronic perceived stress and PAD and health status, and how they do as they recover from intervention. Basically, you do a revascularization in these patients, and if you don't address their mental health status, the trajectory after the intervention and how they fare is significantly different whether you do it or not. So we probably should do it. All these have been published by our group and we've been able to do that. We've done uh, work on depression, stress, physical activity. There in the slide, you see all the different ways how we do it. Uh, this is a study showing, for instance, sedentary behavior and the association with depression and stress and how they fare with clinical outcomes. This is a study that one of our medical students is continued to do or has done, and it's basically how patients do in terms of their uh, baseline uh, depression and physical activity and their relationship. Are you not exercising because are you depressed or are you depressed because you're not exercising? And there is an important association between those two different elements, and you can see it in the slide. And it's uh, significant, statistically significant, and as I said, it's being published, uh, and it's a great opportunity to show this. So depression, distress in PAD, what can you take away? I think there are three main things. Depression and perceived stress are common in patients with PAD. On the rise with increasingly complex patient profiles and rapid growth in younger populations. Associated with increased mortality rates, poor PAD health status recovery, higher costs, longer admissions. We can predict who is at risk of high distress. Perceived stress and depression and physical activity levels in PAD are intertwined. Maybe, maybe one exacerbates the other, which I think is very likely. Let me bring you to my last point. Cardiac and vascular psychology and integrated care. So what do we do? What do we wanna do? And we basically want to integrate psychological health care into the management of patients with PAD. Individuals with PAD will have comorbid mental health condition, would have health behavioral problems, pain. Pain is a major issue in the US because the opiate ep pandemic, epidemic, however you wanna say it. So anything that we do, try to understand the pain and the risk and the association with, between PAD is incredibly important here in the US and is incredibly well-funded. One of our grants, one of our NIH grants comes uh, for us to look at the association between pain and patients with peripheral vascular disease, particularly critical in ischemia. And it broader impacts uh, PAD disease experience for all these patients. So uh, 
we look at patients in a broader socio-ecological context. We look at the individual, we look at the relationships uh, that they possess with their uh, environment. We look at what they do, how they do it. We look at the impact in their community. And certainly we pay attention to social uh, determinants of health. When we do this, we get, then get to understand that all these factors are associated or are markers of higher co-occurrence of mental health conditions and PAD. There are certain behaviors that promote and or prevent uh, the progression of PAD, smoking, physical activity. Smoking is something that we heavily address in our clinics. Pain, I had just described to you, there is a huge correlation and there is a paper coming out from us showing the association of substance abuse and pain disorder in patients with critical ischemia. Certainly that affects their ability to cope with different mechanisms changes the disease adaptation, their health status, and ultimately I have shown you in the last half an hour affects clinical outcome. So we incorporate that in our goals of therapy in patients with PAD. We develop an integrated care and we have shown uh, here in our institution and elsewhere, increasing health status, tre uh, treatment satisfaction, and more important, hard PAD outcomes. We didn't make this up. We didn't create it. It wasn't our invention. It has been established in other pathologies. Uh, I think that if you talked uh, con el profesor senior, you'll see that there has been studies done in patients with heart failure. And this is an elegant study uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing uh, collaborative care for patients with depression and chronic illness. The focus of all this is basically patients with diabetes and coronary artery disease and depressive symptoms were randomized into interventional collaborative care versus not. And we look at the interventions at 12, more, 12 months. So what did we do? <clears throat> they, we improve uh, A1C control, LDL control, blood pressure uh, scoring for mental health disorder. They were less likely to have uh, adjustments in their insulin therapy, antihypertensive, antidepressants, they had better quality of life, greater satisfaction in their care for diabetes, CAD, both, as well as for depression. So it works. It definitely works. Heart disease is ramping. So we're going to be in business, which is a good thing for those that are uh, studying this field right now. But as a consequence of that, we need to be able to integrate everything that we learn and not practice in silos. That is the issue, is that we are a silo specialty, at least here, I don't know in Medellin, I haven't been there in over 20 years practicing medicine. Uh, it may change, it may be different. I will be gladly impressed and surprised if that's the case, but we need to learn that. So what have I told you in the last 45 minutes? Because I wanna leave room for questions and, uh, and I would like to see everyone's faces that I haven't seen. Uh, in many years, is that increasing demands and strains on patient populations and health status is a real problem. We feel it here, and I'm sure you feel it there. Traditional biomedical care models to be extended with bio uh, uh, psychosocial care models to address demands is of critical importance. Rise in cardiovascular burden, unaddressed vascular burden cannot be addressed with biomedical care alone if we don't integrate all these different domains. We have a patient in front of us. I don't have a leg. I don't have an LED. I don't have an SFA. I have a patient. I have a patient with family, with a community, part of a society, and how all these different elements affect all these different domains is important. If you don't try to understand, you're not gonna be able to find the reason why this patient cannot bring the A1C down can bring the A1C down because he doesn't have money. He doesn't have a job. He's depressed. He'd rather go uh, and do something different. Um, somebody is physically or mentally abusing. Like there is all these connotations. So being fixated and yelling at the patient in your office that your A1C is 20 is not really that important if you don't make an effort to try to understand. You cannot do it alone. Program building, value-based care models and measurement-based care is important. Here in the US, the Medicare regulations are addressing this heavily to the point that is of paramount importance that all these programs are implemented for the care of these patients. If you don't have this program, soon we'll be told 
that your reimbursement for an acute MI is going to be dropped unless you have these items. If you do have those items that you're actively screening for this and you're actively treating it, then your reimbursement is high. Unfortunately, or fortunately, here in the US, a lot of it is linked to reimbursement. So money talks, so to speak. Work towards integrated behavioral care uh, in cardiovascular disease is something that I care about, that I'm invested on, and that our institution uh, has uh, marked as a high priority, and we work shoulder to shoulder trying to understand. All the work that we've done, continue to do, cannot be done by myself. I have a group of collaborators, as seen in the slide, Dr. Smoldern, which is my co-director, fellows Gael Romain, which is our brilliant statistician, uh, and we have advanced cardiac fellows and research fellows here, two research fellows, people that have committed two years of their life to look at uh, clinical outcomes in patients with vascular disease. And it's only through this that we can try to implement the things that I'm talking to you and that we can hopefully change the outlook uh, in patients with vascular disease. With that, I pause. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. And I am, as I said earlier, incredibly happy to see uh, or being able to give a talk in my med school. So if you guys got, guys got questions, si tienen preguntas, por favor, háganme las preguntas. Ha, uh, feliz de resolverlas. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Mena, por su excelente presentación. Yo voy a empezar con dos preguntas. Antes le, le comentó, el, el doctor Senior le manda muchos saludos, que lo recuerda mucho de interno. Tuvo que entrar urgente a la sala, entonces por eso no pudo despedirse. Eh, quería hacer dos preguntas para iniciar, que son más de orden operativo y que el, en los estudios ustedes están utilizando eh, escalas como el PHQ8, pero quería preguntar si para capacidad funcional, eh, ¿qué, ¿qué escala usan? Si por ejemplo usan la caminata de seis minutos, no sé si, si, si está igual de validada para los pacientes con enfermedad arterial periférica y si evalúa pues, de forma digna la capacidad funcional los pacientes con claudicación. Y la segunda es en, en relación a, como nos mostró en estos pacientes con, con afectación importante de enfermedades como depresión, si también, al igual que en, que en el escenario de enfermedad cardíaca, en enfermedad vascular periférica también tenemos estudios de, de, de seguridad de estos medicamentos en ese escenario. Gracias, profe. Ya le hago otras preguntas que a ella con la audiencia. Listo. Uh, te respondo la, la primera. En términos de uh, escalas para un, uh, que hayan sido validadas, eh, el, la caminata de seis minutos la utilizamos. Hay algunos otros que utilizamos. No han sido uh, tan validadas como los scores de salud mental. Uh, el problema con eso es que hay una variabilidad grande y en el manejo de los pacientes aquí en Estados Unidos particularmente, uh, muchos entran a revascularización de entrada, lo cual crea una, significa, una, una limitación significativa en la interpretación de eso. En términos de la seguridad de los medicamentos uh, en pacientes con enfermedad cardiovascular, um, hay algunos estudios que sí han mostrado que no hay ninguna limitación. Uh, como te decía, el tipo de intervenciones que le damos a estos pacientes no solamente los medicamentos, pero también uh, terapia, terapia cognitiva y todo ese tipo de cosas que los psicólogos le pueden ofrecer a los pacientes. No te oigo, o sea, es, uh... Perdón, el profe Carlos José tiene la palabra y luego la profe Clara. Carlos, es un placer oírte, es, eh, es eh, fantástico y muy grato a, a tus afectos hacia la Facultad de Medicina, por supuesto que te queremos mucho y estamos muy agradecidos con el apoyo que nos das en la formación de nuestros estudiantes cuando has tenido esa oportunidad de apoyarlos. La pregunta que quería hacerte es, eh, siempre hemos trabajado profundamente esos aspectos emocionales en los programas de rehabilitación cardíaca y dentro de los programas de rehabilitación cardíaca, por supuesto, está el paciente con enfermedad arterial periférica. Eh, eh, 
es una, un enfoque integral y donde la parte emocional juega un papel esencial. El paciente hay que volverle otra vez a crear un sentido de vida, una razón de, 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 de cambiar sus estilos de vida y, y muchas veces después de un programa de rehabilitación integral eh, cambian, eh, están mucho mejor a pesar de tener secuelas, eh, su calidad de vida mejora sustancialmente. ¿Cómo participan los programas de rehabilitación cardíaca con este enfoque de ustedes? Doctor, eso es una muy buena pregunta y yo recuerdo mucho el trabajo que usted hacía cuando yo estaba en la universidad en la terapia de rehabilitación. Es una parte integral, profe, porque lo que hacemos aquí es que todo el paciente que tenga un evento cardíaco o periférico es remitido a rehabilitación cardíaca. Aquí el centro de Medicare reembolsa por la terapia de rehabilitación en pacientes con enfermedad periférica. Entonces el paciente viene a la terapia de rehabilitación y inmediatamente se le hacen screens uh, para enfermedad mental y si el paciente... Uh, termina siendo positivo para alguno de esos desórdenes, inmediatamente se hace la, eh, la consulta para ese servicio y los pacientes son vistos en esa calidad y son tratados. Tiene un impacto muy grande y le mostré un estudio donde había una correlación importante entre la terapia física uh, y la depresión y la relación entre cada uno de ellos. Si estás deprimido, no haces ejercicio o si haces ejercicio, uh, hay un incremento en tus endorfinas y el manejo de la depresión es mucho más adecuado. Todo eso lo hemos mostrado. Gracias, Carlos. Profe, un abrazo y muchas gracias como siempre. Un placer, gracias. Profe Clara, ya tiene el, el micrófono activado. Gracias, Emilio. Carlos, buenos días. Bueno, Hola, Clarita, ¿cómo estás? Un abrazo Muy... y un bien grande. Igual para ti. Muchas gracias por esta conferencia tan ilustrativa y tan interesante. Bueno, yo aquí siempre le digo a los residentes que en cardiología uno debería rotar un poquito por psiquiatría, porque tienes toda la razón, una comorbilidad muy frecuente que vemos en pacientes cardiovasculares es la depresión, la ansiedad. Yo creo que uno debería tener como algunas herramientas básicas de evaluación de los pacientes. No sé qué te pasa a ti en Estados Unidos, pero aquí a veces es un poquito difícil que la gente acepte ir al especialista en salud mental. A pesar de que uno detecte que hay un problema, es un poquito difícil que la gente acepte visitarlo. Entonces yo creo que uno debería tener como algunas herramientas básicas de tamizaje de estas patologías y también algunos conocimientos básicos de, del tratamiento de algunas de estas enfermedades. No sé cómo ves tú esta parte. Clara, gracias por la pregunta. Sí, yo pienso que todos debemos rotar por psiquiatría por una variedad de razones. Inicialmente porque estamos locos nosotros eh, y lo segundo por lo que tú estás diciendo. Ve, uh, yo pienso que lo que decís vos es muy importante y de hecho uh, lo hacemos en los programas de medicina interna. Todos los residentes de medicina interna aprenden uh, el tamizaje básico de los pacientes con enfermedad mental. De hecho, cada vez que un paciente ingresa, que es hospitalizado, se le hace un screen uh, para depresión y ansiedad. Y dependiendo del resultado de eso, se establecen uh, intervenciones para el manejo del problema del paciente. Por ejemplo, si vos uh, sos positivo para depresión mayor, se lo, y el paciente muchas veces ni siquiera sabe uh, que ese es un problema, uh, inmediatamente se le hace uh, la consulta a, a estos proveedores y ellos vienen al paciente, sea hospitalizado o en consulta externa. Uh, el, el manejo o que nosotros como cardiólogos nos involucremos en el manejo de la enfermedad mental, es una arma de doble filo, en el sentido de que inicialmente nosotros somos cardiólogos, nosotros no somos ni psicólogos ni psiquiatras. Yo pienso que hacer el screen es perfecto, identificarlo es perfecto, pero el manejo es muy complicado. Yo pienso que es importante que lo reconozcamos y que lo entendemos porque muchos de los medicamentos y de las intervenciones interactúan con lo que nosotros le vamos a dar. Pero es importante de que la persona que sea capacitada y adecuada um, para el manejo de sus pacientes sea involucrada. Una cosa que es muy importante es lo que tú dijiste. Aquí en Estados Unidos hay un estigma grande de la enfermedad mental. Uh, igual que lo hay en otros países. Una de las cosas que hemos hecho aquí en nuestra comunidad es hacer mucha propaganda a, a la conexión de enfermedad mental y enfermedad cardiovascular de tal manera de que los pacientes sean desestigmatizados y 
entiendan que esto es un problema. Igual que tener diabetes es estar deprimido. Y si lo tratas, probablemente resulte en un manejo adecuado eh, de tus eh, riesgos cardiovasculares. Muchas gracias, Carlos. Listo, Clarita. Un abrazo. Cuídate bastante. Hay una pregunta, profe, acá en el, en el chat de uno de nuestros fellows. Eh, son dos, dos preguntas. La primera, si, si viéramos entonces empezar a considerar los, las enfermedades mentales y, y los problemas psicosociales dentro del abordaje del riesgo cardiovascular residual. Y la segunda, ¿cómo, cómo abordan ustedes la, la captación de los pacientes digamos, dentro, de la, dentro del mismo evento índice, después de un evento, por ejemplo, de, de isquemia aguda de miembros inferiores o, o un evento coronario? Pues la primera pregunta, eh, ¿lo de, ¿se debe considerar un factor de riesgo? 100%. Eh, yo pienso que es un factor de riesgo grande y si no lo manejan adecuadamente, el paciente no va a, hacer, no va a tener un buen resultado. Uh, ¿Cuál fue la segunda pregunta que me dijiste? ¿Cómo captan ustedes los pacientes? Ah, ¿cómo los detectamos? Sí. Siempre que el paciente viene a consulta externa o uh, que viene o que siempre que es hospitalizado se le hace el screen para depresión y cuando viene a consulta externa uh, a intervalos de seis meses se le vuelve a hacer el mismo screen uh, de depresión y ansiedad. Es en este momento es en lo que estamos uh, enfocados en esas dos patologías, pero se hace a través de esos screens. Muchas gracias, profe. Eh... Por el momento no, no veo más preguntas. Yo creo que en, en cumplimiento al tiempo podemos dar eh, por finalizada la sesión. De nuevo, le agradecemos muchísimo, doctor, en nombre del Departamento de Cardiología de la Universidad de Antioquia. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos. Muchas gracias, muchachos. Que estén muy bien. Un abrazo y espero que nos podamos ver pronto uh, en persona. Saludos a todos. Realmente, doctor. Muchas gracias y feliz día a todos. Gracias bueno. y saludos, Carlos. Listo, doctor. Cuídese clarita. Chao. Manejate bien.